Thank you for joining us another week of the SEC Sports Guys. I'm your host, Hunter Ames, joined here with Jason Lee, Lemansky Flakes, bringing you another look into this week in the SEC. On today's show, we'll be covering seven of the SEC teams uh, and their postseason play in the bowl games. In a couple weeks from now, we will definitely be covering the national championship game, which features the Alabama Crimson Tide and the LSU Tigers. Let's go ahead and get started with today's show. Franklin Mortgage Music City Bowl will be played on December 30th. This will be feature the Mississippi State Bulldogs, ending the season 6-6 six and six and 2-6 and six in the SEC. They will be playing the Wake Forest Demon Deacons with the same record of 6-6 six and six, but 5-3 and three in the ACC. This game will be played in Nashville, Tennessee. The game will air on ESPN at 640. This will mark the first time that these two teams have met. Wake Forest started out the season strong at 4-1, but has lost five of the last six. Earlier in the season, they managed to knock off a pretty good Florida State team, but they lost on a last-second field goal to the ACC champs, Clemson. They were humbled by Vanderbilt last, the last game of the season, 41-7. Mississippi State has had troubles of their own in playing in what might be the best division in college football, the SEC West. They finished off their season beating Ole Miss 31-3. Wake Forest quarterback Tanner Price, who has thrown for 2,800 yards this season, and the Demon Deacons ranked 33rd in the nation in passing. Uh, Lemansky, I want to start with you. What does Coach Mullen, Mullins need to do to, uh, to slow down this very productive Demon Deacons uh, offense? Mississippi State, they have to control the line of scrimmage. Everyone knows they're a run first team, and by them controlling the line of scrimmage, they will get more yards on the ground with their quarterback and Vic Ballard. And I think by running the ball, that gives them a great chance to win the game. All right, Lee. What does Wake Forest need to do in this game uh, if they want to win? Well, they're going to have to remember what they did early in the season. As you said earlier, they knocked off Florida State, but they've lost five of the last six games. So Jim Groh's definitely going to have to uh, instill confidence in this team, and they've got to feel like they can they can go against this Mississippi State Bulldog team and come out with a victory and not, not concentrate on those losses uh, late in the year that they have. It's going to go back to stopping Ballard and, and, and the quarterback there, and, and that's going to be the key. All right, we'll go ahead and stay with you. Prediction on this one. Um, in the end, I think Mississippi State's going to come out on top. I think that offense is, is too strong. I think the SEC defense going against Wake Forest is going to be strong as well. Wake Forest's defense has given up 28, 28 points a game. They definitely cannot afford to do that to Mississippi State. In the end, I think it's going to be close for the first half, but I think Mississippi State's running game will take over in the second half. Okay. So Mississippi State... Close, big? Uh, Mississippi State, 31-24. Uh, okay. Mississippi State, I have Wake Forest? I have Mississippi State 24-14, and I feel like, uh, you know, although Mississippi State has had a disappointing season, I think they will win this last game and go into the offseason, you know, on a positive note. And I do feel like uh, uh, Wake Forest will give them a great challenge in the first half, but I also think that they will pull off in the second half. I'm with you guys on this one. I'm going to head with Mississippi State as well. I, think, I just think that there's going to be too much uh, for Wake Forest. And the last game of the season, watching, there wasn't a whole lot of games on TV, but watching Wake Forest and, uh, and Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt showed Mississippi State way too much. Um, so I think Mississippi State, I'm, I'm looking at them big in this game. Uh, we're going to move on to the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. This will be played on New Year's Eve. It features the Cincinnati Bearcats. They are 9-3 and three on the season and 5-2 and two in the Big East, taking on the Vanderbilt Commodores with a 6-6 six and six record and 2-6 and six in the SEC. This game will be in Memphis, Tennessee. It will be on ABC at 3.30. First-year head coach uh, James Franklin leads the Commodores into this year's bowl game, making it only the fifth time that Vanderbilt has gone to a bowl game in school history. On the other side of the things, the Cincinnati Bearcats won a share of the Big East Championship. They were edged out by West Virginia in a tiebreaker. Uh, one of the Bearcats' losses came back in September against a struggling Tennessee team that ended up uh, winless in the SEC. Uh, I, did, I did notice one little fact in there. 13 points separated Vanderbilt from ending their season at 9-3. and three. I think that's pretty huge. There was a few close ones there with Georgia and Arkansas uh, and Florida. Uh, so, number one, I want to go uh, with Lemansky. What has James Franklin done different in his first year with his Vanderbilt team that has begun to start raising eyebrows in the SEC? Well, what Franklin has done, you know, he has installed uh, a great sense of motivation into the players, and he has put in a winning mentality in the locker room, and he's raised a bunch of eyebrows not only in the SEC but in the entire nation because Vanderbilt coming into the season, they did not have high expectations for their football program, and for them to, you know, make a bowl game with a 500 record is just great and their future is very bright. 
All right, I'm, I'm going to stay with you real quick on this one. Um, neither team has even beat a ranked team this season. Um, what does a win mean for Cincinnati in this one? Well, the win for Cincinnati, it would, it would prove wonders also. And, uh, you know, they were etched out by West Virginia, and West Virginia won the Big East Championship. But uh, Cincinnati, you know, they had a pretty solid season. And I feel like with this win, you know, it, they will go in the off season with high heads and high hopes for next season. All right. On the other side, what does win here for Vanderbilt mean? Vanderbilt has has definitely played with confidence late in the year, and and James Franklin has is is takes all the credit for that. And so they they need to win here in the bowl game go, going into next year. Get James Franklin had an incredible year first year going into the second year. They need a win to kind of jumpstart that program. As you mentioned earlier, Ames, there were three games that Vanderbilt lost close that prevented them from having a nine win season, which would have been one of the best in Vanderbilt. So I think. Um, if, if they can knock off Cincinnati here, I think they'll have a lot of confidence going into the 2012 season and have an even better year than they did this year. All right, and good. You just talked about what Vandy kind of needs to do. With all that being said, how does Cincinnati, uh, coming from the Big East, how are they going to – what do they need to do against Vandy? Well, you know, the Big East has, has taken a hit this year. A lot of people didn't think that they deserved, you know, that they deserved a, a team in the in the big in the BCS Bowl, and, and West Virginia got got left out there. So Cincinnati is not only playing for themselves, but they're playing for their entire conference. They they have to they have to stop Vanderbilt's offense. Cincinnati is Cincinnati has given up a ton of points in all of their games this year. But on the flip side of that, offensively they've been great. They've been averaging 33 points a game themselves. So they got to make sure the offense is clicking and they got to find a way to stop Vanderbilt's offense. All right, and moving over to you, what does a win here for Vanderbilt do for this season? It will it will be great for them because uh, a team like Vanderbilt, you know, they're not really known for their football, you know, history, but a win, a bowl game will set them up for a 2012 season and they will bring in more recruits and give them more confidence for next year. All right, staying with your prediction in this one, Vandy. Cincinnati, who do you got? I have Vanderbilt 28 to 21. I feel like Vanderbilt is too strong for them, but I do think it will be a great game. I think Vanderbilt will pull out in the fourth quarter. All right, staying with you. Prediction in this one. I have Vanderbilt 28 21. The game will be very close, but I see Vanderbilt pulling this out in the end. All right. Jason? The one example we have from from Cincinnati against an SEC team this year, as you said earlier, was Tennessee, and Tennessee beat them 45 to 23, uh, and then Tennessee goes on and doesn't even win a conference game. I think Vanderbilt is much better than Tennessee, as we saw in their matchup. I don't think Vanderbilt has any problems with Cincinnati here. I've got Vanderbilt 45 to 23. Good. I'm, I'm also going big with Vanderbilt on this one. I just think I see them nine and three on the season and only losing two games uh, within the uh, within the Big East. But I, this Vandy team, they're just just—they're much better than that 6-6 six and six record shows. And I've got Vandy big in this one. We're going to go ahead and take our first break. When we come back, we'll be covering the rest of the uh, postseason for the SEC uh, football teams. Welcome back to the SEC Sports Guys. Moving right on into the uh, rest of the bowl games. Looking uh, next at the TaxSlayer.com Gator Bowl. We played on January 2nd. This features the Ohio State Buckeyes, 6-6 six and six on the season, 3-5 and five in the Big Ten. Versus the Florida Gators coming in at six and six in the S, uh, six and six on the regular season, three and five in the SEC. This game will be in Jacksonville, Florida. Be played on ESPN at one o'clock. Florida head coach Will Muschamp in his first season with the Gators probably didn't have six and six in his mind for the entire season. Ohio State head coach Luke Fickle will be coaching in his last game as the leader of the Buckeye squad. It's Mer Urban Meyer's former team facing his future team which seems to be two teams that need a big win to fi finish off a disappointing season for both of them. LeMancy, start with you. Buckeyes lost three straight here. Uh, what does Fickle need to do uh, in preparing these guys to get those losses off their minds and get prepared for the Florida Gators? What you just do is just say, look, guys, this is the last game of the season. We haven't really been – we had a really disappointing season, but with the win, we, you know, we will go into the offseason with a positive outlook. And they, he should just get them prepared since this is his last game as a head coach, and he should just tell him just to win this for him. You know, just win this for him, and hopefully Ohio State will come out with a great intensity for the Florida Gators. Let me throw this one at you real quick, too. Uh, Luke Fickle, we already know, will not be back as the head coach of the Buckeyes. Would a win here improve his chances uh, as a head coach maybe somewhere else? Uh, I think so. Um, you know, I think, you know, with the win against Florida Gators, you know, a prestigious SEC school, 
uh, you know, it would definitely help his chances. It would not hurt it. It would definitely help it. And uh, given the fact that the SEC is the most dominant conference and Ohio State has had that history of losing the SEC teams, if he wins his game, it would definitely help his case. Moving over, uh, the Florida Gators ended their season losing the in-state rival Florida State. Um, what does a win do here to help Muschamp and that staff over there as they prepare for next season? They've got a lot to play for here. They, they've been beat up all season long. They're finally healthy. Brantley's back at quarterback. And, and not only that, they look across the field to an Ohio State team who now their new coach is Florida's old coach who said earlier – who said earlier that he couldn't coach anymore. He was tired, he retired. Uh, now all of a sudden he comes back in the game and he's, he's gonna be the head coach against Ohio State. So I think they've got a chip on their shoulder. I think they wanna prove that six and six does not prove the, you know, the talent that they have on their team. And they also wanna get one against their, their previous coach. Lemansky, uh, key players for Ohio State uh, that they're gonna really need to step up here for Ohio State to win this one. Well, the key player for the Ohio State Buckeyes is running back Dan Heron. Now, he was suspended the first six games of the season due to the scandal at Ohio State, but the first three games since his suspension, he was uh, rushing for an average of six yards a carry, and that's pretty, that's pretty dangerous. You know, he's a pretty dangerous running back in, in an open field. He's very explosive, and to add on to that, uh, Ohio State has a mobile quarterback, Braxton Miller. He's, very, he's a very talented dual-threat quarterback, and I think he's going to um, cause – the Florida Gators defense problems. Okay. Moving over to the Florida Gators, who are the key players for that squad that need to get it together for this one? Well, obviously it's going to start with John Brantley, a quarterback, but Chris Rainey has got to step up in this game. He, in my opinion, he's one of the best running backs talent-wise in the SEC, but he hasn't shown much this year. A lot of that is play calling. A lot of that, a lot of that is the offensive line. He's only had 790 yards this year, so he's definitely got to have a big game, help Brantley out so it's not all on Brantley's shoulders. And then in turn, Brantley's going to have to be more consistent throwing the ball. That's been his biggest issue this, this far is, is interceptions. A lot of that has been injuries. He's fully healthy now, so he's got to be consistent. Rainey's got to step up. All right, prediction time. Who do you have in this one? You know, I think that, uh, you know, these are two teams who obviously haven't had a good year, Been both of them 6-6 six and six coming in. Uh, if you look at the whole picture offense and defensively, I think Florida has more talent. I think Ohio State probably has a little bit more to play for with everything they've overcome. In the end, with this game being in Florida, I give Florida the edge. I think they're going to have the crowd behind them as well. I think it'll be a close game. I've got Florida 24-21 over Ohio State. All right, prediction. Well, this is a, a matchup of two prestigious schools. They had a down year, but their future is bright. And I also see a close game. That, but I have Ohio State winning 24-21. And the reason why I have Ohio State winning that is because, like I explained, um, Dan Heron and Braxton Miller, they will keep the Gators defense guessing, you know, if they key in on one, the other will, you know, have a great running game. And the Florida Gators offense is very stagnant, and they're very one-dimensional. And the Florida Gators defense is great, but Ohio State will wear them down because the Florida Gators offense will keep going three and out, three and out. But I do see a great game. It will be 24-21. I do, I do agree with you. I think it will be a great game, though their seasons have been very depressing to watch. Um, I've got Ohio State in this one. I think they're going to end that three-game losing streak that they're on. It will be a close game. I don't even know if they'll score as many points as you guys. I think y'all had the same scores just flipped over. I don't even know if they'll score that many points. Um, but I think that they're going to go ahead and pick up this win in the Gator Bowl. Like you said, it is in front of a home crowd. I still think that Ohio State comes down and takes care of his business in here. Now we're going to take a look at the Chick-fil-A Bowl. It'll be played on New Year's Eve. Features the Virginia Cavaliers. They are 8-4 on the season, 5-3 in the ACC. Versus the Auburn Tigers, 7-5 on the season and 4-4 four four in the SEC. The game will be played in the Georgia Dome and Atlanta, Georgia. It'll be televised on ESPN. Game time is set for 7-30. Auburn will end this year's season where they will begin next year's season. It's a redemption time for the Tigers since they were blown out by three of their last four SEC opponents. Those included LSU, Georgia, and Alabama. Virginia is also looking to pick up the pieces after being blown out by in-state rivalry uh, Virginia Tech. The Cavaliers have had a pretty decent season knocking off Georgia Tech and Florida State. Uh, Coach Lee, I want to take it to you first. Ted Roof has gone on uh, defense for Auburn. Um, what does Coach Chiswick need to do to go ahead and get the Tigers prepared on defense for this game? I'm very interested to see what the Tigers are going to have defensively here. Chiswick is known, before he was a head coach, he was known as a defensive guy. So like, he's going he's gonna to 
make it make it his own own personal thing now defensively. As you said, Roof is gone, so we're going to see what what changes they make defensively. Uh, hopefully, a, a lot stronger for the Auburn fans because that was the biggest thing coming in coming into the season was how was that defense going to do? All right. Uh, Head coach Mike London, uh, ACC, named a ACC Coach of the Year at the end of the season, uh, is bringing in this Cavalier team. He has taken the Cavaliers from 3-8 and eight last season to 8-4 and four this season. If you could call him on the phone right now and give him any advice for playing Auburn, what would you tell him? Well, I would tell Coach London to open up the playbook. And what I mean by that is the Virginia Cavaliers have basically had a somewhat of a conservative offense. And, you know, in Auburn's blowout losses, all of those teams had opened up the playbook. They had sent trick plays, deep passes, and that's what Virginia needs to do because the Auburn secondary and the defense as a whole is very gullible to the big play. And I think that Virginia has big plays in the game that should be able to come out on top. All right, coming back to you, uh, the suspension of Michael Dyer will not be playing in the bowl game this season. What kind of effect on the uh, Auburn's offensive side? They've struggled on offense. Michael Dyer has been that workhorse. Uh, what is his absence going to mean to that offense? Yeah, I mean, you can't take out an all-SEC running back and expect to be the same offensively. They're going to take a hit there, but it, it offers some younger guys to step up. Ontario McCaleb's gotten a lot of carries. He's been averaging about 15 carries a game this season. And then a freshman coming in, Trey Mason. He's going to he's gonna take over the carries for Dyer. Uh, he is the next up-and-coming running back that Auburn is hoping for. So you're going to go ahead and get a glimpse of the future there. And then Clint Mosley is going to have to have a, a much better game passing the ball because he's not going to have that running attack that he's used to with Dyer getting 100 yards every game. All right, prediction time, guys. Lemansky, who do you have in this one? I have Virginia 24 to 17. I feel like with the absence of Michael Dyer, I think that's going to hurt Auburn tremendously, and I feel I, I see Virginia winning this game. You know, both teams have almost a month to prepare here. I think Gene Chizik's going to, you know, put his hand on, on the defense with Ted Roof being out. I think that you're going to see a much improved Auburn defense. They, they will offensively. Auburn will be losing a little bit with Mike Dyer, but I think they've got a couple running backs that can step up. They've got a really close game here, but I think Auburn in the end will, t will take advantage. I think of the experience of playing in the Georgia Dome the last, the last couple year years or a couple games now uh, will be the difference. I've got Auburn 28-24 over Virginia. Yeah, I also, uh, I've also picked Auburn. I went back and forth on this pick all, all week long. Yeah. Do I go with Auburn? You know, with the SEC sports guys, who you're thinking it's a guarantee, but going back and forth with Auburn, Virginia, you know, the last time they met was back in the 90s, Virginia shut them out. Uh, I just don't think that's going to be the case this time. I don't think it's going to be a very high scoring game, but I do believe that Auburn pulls off a close one here. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be finishing off the last three uh, SEC teams and their opponents for this year's bowl season. And welcome back. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the Outback Bowl. We played on January 2nd, features the Michigan State Spartans. Uh, ten and three on the season, seven and one in the Big Ten versus the Georgia Bulldogs. Ten and three on the season, seven and one in the SEC. The game will be played in Tampa, Florida. Be televised on ABC at one o'clock. After an 0-2 start, many Georgia fans are already ready to call it quits with head coach Mark Rick. Uh, but he went on to win ten straight and we crowned champions of the SEC East. Michigan State, on the other hand, beat Wisconsin during the regular season, but in their rematch for the Big Ten championship. They fell short in a heartbreaker loss that kept them out of this year's Rose Bowl. Besides the national championship game, guys, uh, this is a game that I'm going to be glued to uh, watching TV on this one. This is my favorite game minus the national championship. Uh, definitely looking forward to this one. Uh, Coach Liam, we'll go with you first on this one. Michigan State ranks nationally ninth on points allowed. What does Aaron Murray and that Georgia offense need to do to put points on the board against this stingy defense? Well, first of all, I do agree with you. I think this is going to be one of the key – key bowl games all season long. This is a very intriguing matchup. I think Aaron Murray's got to be uh, very consistent here. He's got to keep his composure. Uh, he did that against Auburn. His, against Auburn was his best game of the year. He was making passes all over the field, short passes, long passes. And then against LSU, I realized that he was pressured a lot more, but he's got to keep his composure and be a lot more consistent. If he can do that, I, th I would give him a very good shot against Michigan State's defense. All right, moving over, Isaiah Kroll, he should be healthy for this one. Uh, what is he going to need to do to have a good game? Well, just like you noted, he's been playing the last few games with injuries, and I do feel like those injuries have hampered him. But, you know, when healthy, he should be able to, uh, you know, run through the tackles, you know, at 100%. And I think if he does that and just continues to get great gains, then he should help the Bulldogs. Okay. 
Moving back to you, uh, Kirk Cousins, quarterback from Michigan State, great season. 3,000 yards, 24 passing touchdowns. Uh, he's had great success in the Big Ten. What does Georgia's defense need to do in preparing for this one? Linebackers are going to be key. They've got to get pressure on Cousins. If they don't, it's going to be a long day for them. Uh, we've got Alec o Ogletree and Jarvis Jones at linebacker. Had a great game against Georgia Tech, both of them. Jones had uh, 11, 11 solo tackles by himself. So definitely going to have to get pressure. Uh, if they can do that, I think Georgia's defense can create turnovers. Uh, and, and that would be the key to the game is going to be turnovers between these two teams. Keys to the game for Michigan State. Key, keys to the game, key players. Let's well, go for it. Well, the keys for the game for Michigan State is to pressure Aaron Murray. Uh, you know, LSU pressured Aaron Murray in the SEC title game, and we, and we saw how that turned out. And Michigan State is kind of similar in LSU's defense, not talent-wise, but as far as agenda as in overloading the box or whatever. The Michigan State Spartans, they have the talent to stop Georgia. But it's all a matter if they get to the quarterback and pressure Aaron Murray. All right, keys to the game for Georgia. This is going to be a very physical game between both teams. If you look at Georgia's wins this year, they've started off strong. If you look at their losses, they got they got behind they, and they weren't able to come back. So the key for Georgia is a very strong start. And again, going back to the Aaron Murray, he's got to be very consistent, take charge of that offense. All right, go ahead. Prediction time. I think that, as we said earlier, this is going to be one of the best ball games the whole season. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to seeing this one. Uh, so far, I've gone all SEC here. I think it's going to be very close. I think it's going to be a field goal at the end of the game, maybe even an overtime game. But I'm going against the SEC for the first time uh, today in our show. I've got Michigan State. I think Kirk Cousins is just going to be too much. I see him getting 250, 300 yards passing. I think maybe a field goal at the end will t put the Spartans on top of the Bulldogs. I have the Georgia uh, Bulldogs winning 35 to 21. I feel like Aaron Murray will have a career game, and I just feel like Michigan State will they will hang around in the first quarter, but then Georgia will pull off in the second. Yeah, I struggled with this one, uh, Georgia Michigan State. Um, I do believe it'll go down to the last minutes of the game in this one. I I almost didn't want to go with Georgia. I picked them last year to beat Central Florida. I think they upset me, broke my heart, and lost to Central Florida. Uh, I'm going with them anyway. I'm going with Georgia. It's going to come down to last minute of the game. Could be a field goal. I just think Aaron Murray, he's having a real special year, and I think he's going to pull this one off. Next, we're going to move into the Capital One Bowl game. We played also on January 2nd, featured the Nebraska Cornhuskers, 9-3 and three on the season, 5-3 and three in the Big Ten against South Carolina, 10-2 and two on the season, 6-2 and two in the SEC. This game we played in Orlando, Florida. be televised on ESPN at 1 o'clock. South Carolina's defense ranks fourth in the nation, but they're sure to have their hands full with the elusive Taylor Martinez and Rex Burkhead. The old ball coach has had his hands full this season with uh, the releasing of former quarterback Steven Garcia and a season-ending injury to running back Marcus Lattimore. Through all this, though, he's still been able to put together a 10-win season. Man's going to go with you first. Uh, Nebraska, they're not top of the nation in passing. Matter of fact, they rank uh, north to South Carolina. Uh, they're ranking 106th and 96th in the nation. So it's going to be a ground game uh, type of game. It's going to be a quick uh, bowl game probably for, for that matter. Uh, who's got the advantage in this one? Well, as far as the ground game is concerned, I, I feel like Nebraska has the advantage. Uh, Martinez and Burkhead, this dynamic duo, they're very speedy. They, they're good at running the read option. I just feel like ground-wise, ground they're very talented. All right. Key players for Nebraska that really need to have a really special game in this one. You know, I think Taylor Martinez as, as a quarterback, kind of a dual threat quarterback, I think he's got to have a good game. Uh, South Carolina has the number nine ranked defense in the country, so he's definitely going to have a tough, you know, a tough task there. But I think he can overcome that. Uh, he's going to have to use his legs and his arm, but I think even more he's, he's got to – He's got to get more yards on first down and second down, create a third and short in the game and not have third and long against that powerful defense. Uh, keys of the game, uh, and what does South Carolina need to do to win this one? Well, what South Carolina needs to do is get Melvin Ingram, defensive man Melvin Ingram, involved in action. And uh, I feel like uh, South Carolina has the talent to stop Nebraska, but um, as noted, you know, throughout their whole season, South Carolina has a very aggressive defense and you know they try to make uh, the big play like in one big play and they're not very too disciplined and this game they have to be disciplined and they have to really have an eye on Martinez because you know he's a very strong threat with the read option. 
All right, we'll go ahead and go predictions. Who do you have in this one? I have South Carolina 24 to 13. I feel like their uh, their defense is too strong, their offense is too strong, and Connor Shaw is going to have a big game quarterback for the South Carolina game. He's going to have a huge game. And I just feel like Martinez is not really going to have, you know, that much effect on the ground game as he would another team because South Carolina's defense is so outstanding. You know, Connor Charles has been getting more and more confident as time go, has gone by, replacing, you know, Steven Garcia. Uh, a, a key player that I think has to step, step up this year is, or in this game is Alshon Jeffries. He had a great year last year, hasn't done much, only seven touchdowns this year. If he can step up, I think South Carolina will, will win going away. I don't think it would be close. Um, in the end, I, I, I agree. I don't think Nebraska is going to be able to score much against this, against this powerful defense. I think South Carolina is too strong defensively. I've got South Carolina 31-21 to 21 in this one. A little higher scoring probably, but I, th I think a lot of points will be scored here. I, I just, I'm, I'm going with South Carolina here. Jadavion, Clowney, um, Elvin Ingram, this is going to be too much. Uh, this is a ground team, and I believe those two will shut that ground game down. And then that's it. Uh, South Carolina is going to win this one. I probably go as much as 10 points in this one. So, moving in, AT&T Cotton Bowl, January 6th, features Kansas State 10 and 2 on the season, 7 and 2 in the Big 12 versus Arkansas 10 and 2 on the season, 6 and 2 in the SEC. We played in Dallas, Texas. The game will be televised on Fox at 8 o'clock. Arkansas's only two losses this season just happen to be the two teams playing for this year's national championship. Kansas State started the season going strong with a seven-game win streak but then suffered back-to-back -back losses to Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Uh, question one, uh, going to Coach Lee, Kansas State have been hanging around the last few years, and this, this was their year. Uh, they have, they, like I said, they just started out strong, seven wins. Um, what does Coach Petrino need to do to shut down this such a fierce opponent, opponent from the Big 12? You know, the Kansas State offense all goes around Colin Klein, and, and, and Petrino is definitely going to have to get a lot of pressure uh, defensively on Klein. He's going to have to be running for his life. If, if they can't do that defensively, it's going to be a long day. I already think this is going to be a high-scoring matchup, so anything Arkansas can do defensively, schematically, trying to get a lot of pressure, blitz packages, whatever, to keep that score down, um, I, th I think they're going to have to do that against Klein. Right. Kansas State, they have played some uh, some – some tougher games this season, but they haven't, I don't believe they face a team like Arkansas. What do they need to do to move the ball against Arkansas? The, the key player for Kansas State's quarterback, Colin Klein. He's a wonderful dual threat quarterback. He's accumulated for 38 total touchdowns. He can beat you on the ground and throwing the pass, and he's a very athletic quarterback. And he, he, can, he can give a defense like Arkansas, who sometimes can be overly aggressive, problems. So, you know, Kansas State is really looking forward to um, Colin Klein having a big game. All right, prediction time. Who do you got? I think this is going to be a high-scoring game. It's going to be a track meet. I've got a lot of points scored here. In the end, I think Arkansas's offense is way too strong for Kansas State defense. I think Tyler Wilson's going to have a huge game. I've got a huge score here, 48-45 40, to 45 Arkansas over Kansas State. All right, prediction time. I have Kansas State beating Arkansas 41-38. And like you said, it's going to be a high-scoring game. And I feel like Colin Klein is going to have a very terrific game. It's going to be a career game for him. And, you know, Arkansas has a tendency of coming up short in a big game. You know, Alabama, LSU this year, they got blown out. So I, I just see a high-scoring game, and it's going to be a good game and a very entertaining game to watch. Uh, although Kansas State, they made a really strong run at it this year. It's been a spectacular season. It's one that they're definitely going to remember for a long time. Uh, and that, that's all great and grand. I just still think Arkansas has got too much experience in the, in the postseason. I think Arkansas pulls it out in this one. Uh, again, high scoring game as well. Uh, I just think field goal, touchdown possibly, but I, I think that Arkansas pulls this one out based on experience alone. That's going to do it for this episode of the SEC Sports Guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you and your family have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.